This will be number one of the biblical hunt for a virtuous woman. And we're going to start with the first woman. Obviously, everybody knows that's Eve. And this is going to be called, You Get It From Your Mother. As you know, Eve is the mother of all living. Everybody came from her. So, if you notice some things about yourself similar to Eve, it's because you get it from your mother. And the thir first thing I want to say is, advantages can't save you. Your advantages cannot save you. They don't make you or break you. Let's look at some advantages that Eve had. Okay, all the way back in Genesis. The first advantage Eve has is Eve was married to a king. Genesis 126. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So Adam was given dominion. And most women, like a man with a lot of power, even at an early age, the movies and cartoons portray a prince or a king as the man you should desire. So what did Eve have? She was just blessed with having a king right out of the gate. That's exactly what Eve had. She had the first man, Adam, for a husband, and he had dominion. He had two crowns, not one, but two. He was king over the kingdom of God because he was born in the image of God, so he was king over the spiritual kingdom, and yet he was also king over the kingdom of heaven, the physical kingdom on earth, because God gave him dominion over it. You might even say that Adam had a third crown because he had the perfect woman. Proverbs 12, 4, A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. You might even say he had that third crown because starting out, Eve was the perfect woman. Eve was made. I mean, she, she didn't have sin. She was innocent. And Eve married a man with power. Eve married the man that named the animals. He was a man of notoriety. This guy named the animals. He's got a lot of power. That's a huge advantage that many women out there wishes she had. So she had the advantage. She was married to a powerful man, a king. Now another advantage... Eve didn't have to worry about comparing herself to other women. Now, a lot of women struggle with that. Imagine, if you probably struggle with this, getting up every day and there's nobody to compare yourself to. You see, in Genesis 2, 21 through 24, it says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So Eve was the first of God's creation to be called woman. So she didn't have any other women around to compare herself to. And I imagine that made her a lot less stressed than the average woman today. You see, women pay a lot of attention to what uh, each other are wearing, how their hair looks, how their skin looks, how their best friend's house looks, and are competitive a lot of times with all that stuff. But Eve had the advantage she was the only woman she didn't have to worry about all that either eve had the advantage of being the only woman you know and like ruckman used to say adam 
thought so much of Eve that he thought she was just the only woman in the world. And that's true. She was just the only woman in the world. Here's another advantage. Eve had a Christ-like husband. He wasn't just a king, but he was a Christ-like husband. You know, a lot of women might say if their husband acted better, that they could do better. Well, Eve had another advantage. Her husband wasn't just a king. He was also Christ-like. In Genesis 2.15 it said, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So Adam actually was a worker. Adam was the first worker. He was a working man. He had a garden that he dressed and kept. And many women would kill for a husband that would just get up and go to work every day. I mean, it's not too much to ask. Just get up and go to work. Well, that's what Eve had. She didn't have to set her alarm, and then make sure he got up. He got up, and he was at work every day. Adam loved his job, so he never took the job out on her. She could go with him to the office. He could get off for vacation anytime he wanted to. There wasn't any women out there for him to flirt with. There was no Lilith out there in the garden tempting him every day to commit adultery. Adam was so Christ-like, <clears throat> that he's literally a picture. He, he's literally a type of the Lord Jesus himself. It says in Genesis 2.21, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh and stood thereof. So Adam, he was put under a deep sleep. You know, sleep in the Bible pictures death. So Adam was put under a deep sleep when he got his bride, and the Lord Jesus also tasted death to get his bride when he died on the cross. You see, there's the picture. Adam, a deep sleep fell upon him, and that's how he got his bride. The Lord Jesus died, and that's how he got his bride. It goes even further. When Adam got his bride, he was punctured in the side. For the Lord to get one of those ribs. When Jesus Christ was getting his bride on the cross, he was punctured in the side when he got his bride. A soldier pierced him in the side with a spear when he was on the cross. So you see the, the picture there. Adam and Eve is a picture of Jesus Christ and his bride. In Genesis 2, 22 and 23, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. So Adam and Eve were bone of each other's bones, flesh of each other's flesh. That's also how it is for Christ and his bride. In Ephesians five thirty through 32, here's the, here's the picture here. For we are members of his body, this is talking about us, me and you, that, that make up the bride of cross. It says we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. And then it says the same thing in Genesis 2.24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. So you see how Adam and Eve is a great picture of Jesus Christ and his bride. Adam is so much a type of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is called the last Adam. In 1 Corinthians 15, 45, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So Adam... A great type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine the advantage Eve had. Not only was her husband a king, but her husband was so Christ-like. Adam taught her the word of God. And I mean, there wasn't much of it. The only command that they had was Genesis 2.17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. 
That was the only command that they had. But I'm sure Adam preached that to her every day, made her memorize it, made her make a copy of it and meditate on it. She had a godly husband. That was an advantage. It is an advantage. You know, when your spouse is a godly spouse, that's an advantage. It's much harder to live a good Christian life when your spouse does not care about the Word of God in the Bible. Eve had a huge advantage there. Now, another advantage that Eve had. <coughs> Eve only had nice things. In Genesis 2, 9, it says, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Notice that every tree was pleasant to the sight. Not just the forbidden one, but all of them. It said every tree that is pleasant to the sight was out there. And it says they had good food. Good food. There's no bad food out there. There was no food out there that somebody was putting stuff in to give you cancer or to make you sick or to make you feel bad or to make you want to just eat more and more and more it was all good food and i imagine walking through the garden would be better than walking through the food court in the mall it would be better than you know getting off the interstate and seeing all these good looking restaurants it, it all looks good it's all free it wouldn't cause weight gain it wouldn't cause heartburn indigestion all that all, all that stuff no stomach aches you could eat as much as you wanted. Open 24 hours a day like Waffle, Waffle House. Open even on Sunday. So you, she could have went there when Chick-fil-A was closed. It was just always open. Genesis 2.10. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it was parted and became into four heads. So nice scenery. She could live on the water. It says, the name of the first is Pison, that is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There is the, there's Bedellium and the Onyx Stone. And see, all this stuff is the stuff that the devil had on his body back when he was a Lucifer. Back when, before he was lifted up in pride, you can check it out, Ezekiel 28. All that stuff right there, gold, Bedellium, Onyx Stone, that's what Lucifer had on him. Before he sinned. I think there's something there. But Adam could take her out there. And it would be like. Their own little. Caves jewelers or whatever out there. But it was all free. They could just take whatever they wanted. He could let her pick out a nice ring every day. A new necklace. Every date night. That's the way it was. And I mean. <clears throat> he probably told her you know. Get anything you want. You're priceless. Just like that verse in Proverbs, Proverbs 31.10. Who can find a virtuous woman? Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? So, you know, Adam probably thought, like, he, like we said, he thought she was just the only woman in this world. And got her everything that she wanted. She had everything she could possibly need, everything she could possibly want. It was there. Another advantage, she had a perfect body. Now that's what women desire, the perfect body. In Genesis 2.25, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. You see, Eve didn't have to worry about all things, all these things that, that women spend so much time worrying about today. Things like cellulite, stretch, stretch marks, muffin tops, all that stuff that they worry about. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Eve was letting it all hang out, flaunting it right in front of Adam. She wasn't ashamed. She was like a little child with her innocence. And her husband would have also had a perfect body also. So she didn't have the temptation of no longer being physically attracted to Adam anymore. There wasn't any donuts or beer, so Adam didn't have this big beer belly he was walking around with. Genesis 2, 10 through 12. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted, and it became into four heads. 
The name of the first is Pison, that is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. You see, since, they, since Adam was formed from the dust of the ground, and there was gold there, is it possible they had gold within their bodies? Just like when Lucifer was created, he had all that stuff within his body. Imagine their skin tone. Imagine how they looked before the fall. Perfect bodies. That's another advantage. But advantages don't automatically make a virtuous woman. Because many advantages can come with many disadvantages. Many times a godly upbringing can bring on attraction to the forbidden. And Eve was undoubtedly attracted to rebellious men. When you say, well, there was no men around. Well, in Genesis 3, you got one showing up. And when he shows up, he appears as an angel of light. That's what Paul said, no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Now, Genesis 3.1, we're going to see Eve, although she was a perfect woman, she had some downfalls. Maybe she's not the virtuous woman we're looking for. In Genesis 3, 1, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Notice the serpent chooses to go after the woman first instead of the man. I think that's significant. He's subtle. He's sly and cunning and deceitful. Just like many men who will come into your life who don't care about anything that the Lord says or he doesn't care about anything that has a, your, a good father has taught you. And Peter says in 1 Peter 3, 7 that the woman is the weaker vessel. Also consider that Adam was first formed. So Eve hadn't been around as long as Adam. So what does the devil do? He puts two and two together. Well, she's the weaker vessel. Adam was first formed. So he goes after her first. The devil chose the easiest avenue he could. And notice the first thing he did was make Eve question the word. He placed doubt on the word. <clears throat> he said, did God really say that? You see, Eve had what God said. But she completely goes against what God said. You know, you could be a woman with every advantage in the world. Like Eve, she had every advantage in the world. But if you stray from the word of God, that's all irrelevant. She had a good father, so no daddy issues. She had a good husband. She had everything she needed. So she had so many advantages. But it all goes back to what do you do? With the word of God. You could be a woman who has gotten the short end of the stick your whole life. You've not had any advantages. And you turn out better than a woman with all the advantages. Because you stay with the word of God. That's what it's all about. What do you do with the Lord? What do you do with his word? All the other stuff doesn't really matter. You do not have to have all that stuff to be a virtuous woman. You don't have to have good parents. You don't have to have a good husband. You don't have to have a good upbringing. All you need to do is realize you're a sinner. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Get a Bible. And then try your best to live for God and do right. You don't have to have all those advantages. Because look what happens to Eve. She had all the advantages. And in Genesis 3, 2, it says, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. So, first the serpent got her to question the word of God, basically saying, Did God really say that? 
Did he really even say that? Then Eve doesn't even have it correct herself, what God actually said. And she added some stuff in there, like she added in, neither shall ye touch it. Then said, lest ye die, instead of, thou shalt surely die, which seems less severe. So already you've seen someone place doubt on the word, someone add to the word, someone flat out change it, and then the devil flat out just denied it. When he said, you shall not surely die, he contradicted it. Eve had every advantage, every advantage in the world. She didn't have anything her past using it as an excuse for what she was about to do. The problem was she didn't have the word of God in her heart like she should have. Here's what God actually said that got Eve all jumbled up because she didn't have it down in her heart good enough. It's, this is what God actually said in Genesis 2.17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. He said, surely die. Very straight to the point there. Notice a thing about Eve is that even though she had everything, she wasn't satisfied with it. All the trees were said to be pleasant to the sight. And the story pictures Jesus Christ and his bride. The devil is approaching Eve to beguile her while her husband is not around. That's what the devil is doing to us today. He's trying to mess up the bride, the chaste virgin, before the groom comes back in the rapture. You see the picture? It seems like Adam's off somewhere and Eve's hanging around that forbidden tree. Here comes the serpent. Here we are down here, occupying till the Lord comes, and here comes the devil to tempt that chaste vir the chaste virgin, the bride, before the Lord comes back in the rapture. You see, the best thing Eve could have done is get away from the man who was seducing, tempting, and coaxing her into sinning. That's the best thing to do, just get away from him. And that's what men are going to try to do is sweet talk you into doing wicked things. It says in Romans sixteen eighteen, By good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. That's what people do. That's what false prophets do, false teachers. People will use good words and fair speeches to deceive you. That's what the devil did when he first showed up. Do you know what the devil is using to tempt Eve with? The fruit of the vine. It doesn't actually say it was an apple, as many teach. Most likely the fruit was a grape, because that's the only fruit that was ever forbidden for anyone to eat in the Bible. You see, if you took the, the Nazarite vow, you couldn't eat of the vine tree. In number 6-4, it says, All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. So, the grape was the fruit, the vine tree, the fruit of the vine tree was the only fruit that was ever forbidden for anyone to eat. So, it makes sense that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was a vine tree. And the serpent was seducing her to partake of the vine tree so that he could look on her nakedness. And what happened to Eve after she ate, out, she ate off the tree? Well, she found out she was naked. In Habakkuk 2.15, it says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest the bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. And the Bible's so up to date because it's exactly what people do today. They're trying to get you to drink wine, drink alcohol, so they can look on your nakedness. The devil was tempting Eve to eat off the vine tree. And expose her nakedness. The evil man wants you in a place where you lack judgment and sweet talks you out of your morals so that you won't be blameless when the perfect man shows up. Another disadvantage of having so many advantages is that you'll find it, it it's even harder to be satisfied. Eve was not satisfied with what she had. She had the whole world. But Proverbs 27.20 says... 
Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. She was unable to be content. It says in Genesis 3, 5, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, this is the serpent talking, he said, God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, that your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He's basically saying, you know, God's just trying to hold you back, Eve. But Eve wanted knowledge she wasn't supposed to have. If it was something she was supposed to have, then God would have offered them this tree freely and told them, just take it and get this knowledge. You see, she couldn't be content. And a key to being happy is being content. Be content with the portion that God's given you. You may not have the best looking house. You may not have the nicest car, or the cutest kids, or the best looking husband, but you still have. That's the thing. You still have something. It says in Hebrews 13, 5, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. In Philippians 4.11, Paul said, Not that I speak in, speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. He said in 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, But godliness with contentment is great gain. You see, you might see a woman who doesn't have the same responsibilities as you, and she's out there living the life of a single woman, and you desire that, and it looks so much fun. But if you talk to them, you'll find most of them most of them are desiring the life that you have. And notice some of the things that go along with with all that stuff that you're desiring to have only leads to just emptiness and sorrow and you're just left empty at the end of the day because none of it is the way God planned for your life and, and it isn't the way he wants it to be. You know, notice that the pleasures of sin only last for a season. It's, it's fun for a little while, living that kind of life. And you'll find that those people that's living that life actually want your life. And so you might have the best of one world. You know, you're married, you got kids, your husband, husband's faithful to you, you're faithful to him. You're established, you got a house, your husband has a job. And you've got the best of that world. But then you see that other world, that single life of your maybe a friend you have or women out there, and you desire it. And then you, you begin to want the best of both worlds. And you start coveting a life that's impossible for you to have while staying right with the Lord. When you start doing that, you're not only going to bring yourself down, but then you're going to bring down the people around you in your life. And that's what happened with Eve. She had the best of the of one world. She had a husband. She had everything she needed. But then here come the serpent. And he showed her this other world. And she started coveting the other world that she couldn't be involved in and stay right with God at the same time. So what happens? She brings her family down with her. Genesis 3, 6. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes. Well, all the other trees were pleasant to the eyes. All the other trees were good for food. You see, you're looking at that life out there and you say, that's pleasant to the eyes. You're seeing how good it looks. Well, look at your life. It looks pretty good, most likely. A tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So, now the Bible says that Adam was not deceived. The woman was deceived. Adam plainly knew he was doing wrong. So you could argue his actions were worse because of that reason. Adam ate the fruit not because he didn't know it was wrong, but because he loved his wife. So would they have ever ate the fruit, would Adam have ever ate the fruit, if Eve never was beguiled, you see? 
It says in 1 Timothy 2, 13 through 14, it says, For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Possibly Adam never would have eaten from the tree had Eve never ate from the tree. Because he wasn't deceived. Adam is the one that brought sin into the world, but he never but he may have never eaten from the tree had Eve never been beguiled by the devil. And Cain never would have killed his brother. You see how a crazy butterfly effect just from the simple decision of Eve putting a fruit to her mouth. Your actions affect your entire family. She saw this other world introduced to her by the serpent she coveted that life and it affected her whole family just like will happen to you when you start wanting this other life that you see that may be portrayed in a song or a movie or you just see one of your friends got this life you start wanting that life and it's impossible for you to have both lives and stay right with god you're going to bring your whole family down <clears throat> And the consequences is of this decision was she brought her family down and she traded in her innocence. You see, Adam and Eve lived in the dispensation of innocence. And I, I think that is a word the devil hates because he's not innocent. And I think he despised them because they were innocent. And I think that's why he enjoys songs that say things against being innocent and pure and there was this old song came out years and years ago with some girl that kept repeating, repeating the phrase, I'm not that innocent over and over again. And I think the devil feels like he's getting glory from a song like that because he was involved in ruining man's innocence. And that's what he did here in Genesis 3, 7. It says, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Eve traded in her innocence for something that she thought that she wanted. And what she got is something she didn't want. And you're going to have a lot of serpents coming your way trying to get you to trade in your innocence and the life, the holy life you have right now for something that you just think that you want. And you're going to find out this thing you think you want isn't what you thought it was after you have it. But notice that they, they, in Genesis 3, 7, they sewed fig leaves together to make themselves aprons. And it's good that even though they lost their innocence, they still had a conscience. You see, they realized they were naked and they were ashamed. They lost their innocence, but they still had a conscience. So after the dispensation of innocence, it goes into the dispensation of conscience. Today we're living in a time when nobody is innocent and they have no conscience. They don't even try to hide their sin anymore. They don't even try to cover it up with leaves anymore. These sodomites today were never in the closet. They parade down your street in high heels, you see. There's no shame there. But Eve lost her innocence. And another consequence is she has broken fellowship with God. In Genesis 3, 8, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. They hid themselves from him. Notice that's broken fellowship. Before they were in complete agreement with God, they wouldn't have hid from God. Now they're hiding from him. But think about it. If you're a mother who hides from God or doesn't even put God into the equation... What will your kids know about God? Who will pray for them? Eve has went downhill quickly. Next, another consequence is a bitter husband. In Genesis 3, 9 through 12, <coughs> it says, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, 
she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Adam just threw her under the bus. Obviously, he's bitter and upset with Eve. He loved Eve. That's why he ate off the tree. But now he's, he's bitter and he's upset. Eve's one-time perfect husband is now fallen. He has lost the image of God. He's lost the crown. And now he's bitter towards his wife. And that's the temptation of a man is to get bitter towards his wife. And that's why Colossians 3.19 says, Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. You see, a wife who leaves the Word of God to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season will end up with a bitter husband. Adam throws her under the bust, shifts the blame to Eve. But he was his own man. He didn't have to eat off the tree. And then Eve shifts the blame to the devil, which, out of everybody, he is the most to blame. She basically says, the devil made me do it. But you see, Eve did have a choice. Adam had a choice. If they would have not ate off the tree, the forbidden tree, and passed the test, they would have went to the tree of life, eaten from it, and lived forever. In perfect, in a perfect state. It says in Genesis three thirteen through 15, And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me. And I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. See, now the devil goes on a mission to attack the seed from here on out. He said, he said that the, her seed was going to bruise his head, so he is on a mission to destroy the seed, even all the way up to me and you. You see, Jesus Christ is the promised seed, and me and you are in Christ, so therefore he attacks us. But Eve, so far, even though she was the perfect woman, the first woman, so far she's not looking like the virtuous woman that we're hunting for even though she had all the advantages. At one time, she was the most perfect woman to ever walk the face of the earth. But she stepped out on the Word of God. She stepped out on Him. However, we can learn something else here. Just because you have a bad past or have done something catastrophically sinful in your past doesn't mean you can't become a virtuous woman or become the virtuous woman that you used to be. Notice that hard times can make good women. Eve will now suffer the consequences of her sins, but she doesn't let those consequences push her further away from God as some people do. In Genesis 3.16 it says, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Notice her multiplied sorrow and her in conception. Having a baby is so painful that God compares the hardest times to a woman in travail. Just like in 1 Thessalonians 5.3, it says, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. And in John 16.21, a woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is, hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. Because of the fall, we have to experience tough times. But tough times make good men. And tough times can make good women. Ecclesiastes 7.3 says, Sorrow is better than laughter. For by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. You see, you don't have to push God further away because of His judgment on your life or because of the hard times that He's allowing you to go through that maybe aren't even judgment on your life, but He's just simply trying to make you better. You see, 
Eve had things going on that could have made her angry and made her push God away. You know, her husband throwing her under the bus, for example, or the fact that she's got to go through this painful childbirth. Not only that, but her husband has to be away and work now. Then come home tired, which equals less attention for her. See, in Genesis three seventeen through 18, because Adam did this, sin look what happens and unto adam he said because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which i commanded thee saying thou shalt not eat of it cursed is the ground for thy sake in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee and thou shalt eat the herb of the field notice the curse brought thorns and thistles for adam to deal with and when the Lord took our curse and died on the cross, what did they give him? A crown of thorns. And it says in Genesis 3.19, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. See, Adam would no more have his dream job out in the garden. He had to sweat and labor hard to put food on the table. This would inevitably result in him being away from Eve longer and make him tired when he got home. So therefore, he's not going to be giving her much attention. He's probably not going to talk much. Maybe in a bad mood, grumpy. <clears throat> and I'm sure that instantly began to get into fights because of it about how Adam doesn't care for her like he used to. And Eve probably questioned him on getting with Lilith, Lilith behind his back. And to which Adam would reply, there is no will with Eve. The devil's tricking you again. You know, Adam was just tired from the labor. And Eve could have been bitter about this herself. Been upset about the painful childbirth. Been upset about Adam throwing her under the bus. But hard times can make good women if they allow God to work in their lives. And it says in Genesis 3.20, And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. So if you noticed any of Eve and her characteristics in you, it's because you got it from your mother. In Genesis 3.21, And to Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Now Eve has to worry about what she's going to wear. But hard times make good women. And I believe that Eve <clears throat> let these hard times turn her into a virtuous woman. Eve was right with the Lord after the fall, I believe. In Genesis 4.1 and 4.2, it says, And Adam knew Eve his wife. They came together, and they had a child. Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived. She didn't leave Adam, even though he threw her under the bus back there. Eve didn't leave Adam, even though he was working, sweating, probably tired when he got home. She stayed with him, and they bear Cain, and look what she says. And she said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. She was taking the Lord in consideration. And she believed that what she was getting, she was acknowledging that God was allowing her to have it. Now, even though Cain wasn't the man from the Lord, as we find out, I believe Eve was patiently waiting on the Lord to bring the promised seed. And obviously, she raised Abel right. Cain didn't turn out good, but I believe she raised Abel right because he eventually, <clears throat> he eventually brings the proper animal sacrifice. Eve started out perfect. She messed up. She went down in history as part of the reason that we're in the mess that we're in now. But hard times can make good women, and she didn't let past mistakes or her disadvantages or her newfound sorrow stop her from following the Lord. So most likely, she became a virtuous woman. Now, do I believe that Eve is the perfect example for a virtuous woman in the Bible. We don't know how, just how good she was after the fall. But I believe that she became a virtuous woman after the fall. 
just like you, even though if you have trouble in your past, you've done some things you're not proud of, you can become the virtuous woman today. First, by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, getting saved if you're not, then getting in the Bible daily and trying to follow the Lord.